the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on in. Come on in. Praise the Lord. Thank you for the opportunity again to share with you the message on the Bible, Old and New Testament covenants. The heaven, new heaven and earth. Part two. This is actually part two because we've been going through this and really, really sharing a lot of information on this essence of how God has developed us through an old covenant system and bringing us into the New Testament system that we can all have right to the tree of life. And there's a lot of things we've discussed, a lot of things we've talked about, and I want to get right into this tonight. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. But just learning, growing, and developing according to what you know is truth from what you've been taught or how you've been taught it in essence to what you're learning now and understanding how God is doing what he's doing in the midst of his church today. So that being said, I'm going to get right to it. Trying to get my live on over here, make sure uh, my live is still playing. So let's get right in here to it. Last week we talked about some things that really, really made a difference. And it gave me a lot of insight on some things that I wasn't aware of. But the entire old covenant system, the heavens and the earth, was about to be shaken and destroyed by the fire in AD 70, just the, up, up the, the back cap on what we were doing, talking about. And only the invisible and the eternal kingdom of God was going to remain. Now the reading that we had in these passages in Hebrews chapter 12 and 2 Peter 3, it was a significant shift from what many of us have believed when we talk about this here teaching and understanding because a lot of us look at this as a futuristic and not a thing that they was looking for to happen at that very time maybe. Instead of telling us about a catalytic global event in our future, this was actually speaking of a coming transition that happened in our past. And this leads us asking the question, what about the end of the world? Is that an event in our future? Stuff like that. The New Testament does not explicitly speak of an end of the world. However, we can find clues to the an answer in what it does say about the prophesied new heaven and new earth. So tonight we're going to get into the new heaven and the new earth. In 2 Peter 3, after establishing that the, the trapping of the old covenant, including the temple and the elements of the Judaism, are destined to burn, Peter then envisions what will come afterwards. And so we're going to start right in there tonight in 2 Peter 3 and 13 in our first scripture. And it says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And some translation says, uh, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Now this is a reference of, uh, to several Old Testament prophecies when we look at it. At the beginning of 2 Peter 3, Peter gives a framework for what he is about to say. Now he's going to remind his readers of two things. The words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the commands given by our Lord and Savior, Jesus, through the apostles. And that's in 2 Peter 3 and 2. He said that they that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Now, when he spoke this in his first part, which we have already looked at, he focused on Jesus, and we looked at Matthew 24 and the prophecy about his coming. And now, in the second part, we're going to talk about the part by him mentioning the new heaven and the new earth. He 
turns to a material from the holy prophets of old. Now, in particular, he was referred to two passages of prophet Isaiah. Now, the first one is in Isaiah 65 and 17, and it says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. And one translation in the NASB says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Still same essence of what they're saying, but this was one of the prophecies that it was fulfilling based on what we read also in 2 Peter 3. Now, the new heavens and the new earth was scripturally in Isaiah chapter 66 and 22. It says this, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. Hallelujah. Now, the holy prophets of old, as well as the first century believers in that time, they look forward to an expectation to a new heaven and a new earth. Now, when we talk about the Apostle John in his great revelational vision that he got, he had, he gives us the longest and the most detailed prophecy of the new heaven and the earth. But the question is, what exactly does this phrase new heaven and new earth describe? And I want to share this with you. Many people teach that it refers to our eternal life with the Christ after death. In other words, it is a glorious reality that believers experience once they go to heaven. In this understanding, there is a book called Navigating the Book of Revelation that was written by a scholar named Kenneth Gentry. He shows that this popular teaching is not the primary point of the biblical idea of a new heaven and a new earth, especially as it's portrayed in Revelations 21 and Revelations 22. You can read that for yourself at your own recognizance, your own time. But to do so, Gentry, the scholar, Kenneth Gentry, he looked back to Isaiah 65, 17 to 20, which was John's primary source of material from Revelation 21 and 22. And this passage in Isaiah, it describes the new heaven and the new earth in very earthly terms that include birth and death. Let's look at it. Isaiah uh, 65, uh, 17 to 20. I just started verse 18 because we read 17 earlier. It says this right here. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more dense an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now when we read that, he was speaking of, in verse 20 there, he said, Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies who dies at a hundred will be taught a, a married child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered a curse. That's what it says in verse 20. There. Now in heaven people will not be born and they will not die. Thus, this prophecy from Isaiah must be 
must not be referring to our eternal state in heaven. Can't be. Likewise, when we look at Revelation 21 and 22, it contains multiple references to earthly realities that do not exist in heaven. First, these chapters clearly describe the nations of the earth as separate entities, which is a present temporal condition rather than an eternal one. Now, in eternity, national boundaries will cease to exist. We see in this in Revelation 21, chapter 21 and verse 24. Here's the verse right here. It says, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Hallelujah. Now, this speaks of here of Jesus' establishment of the church as a light of the world. And you know, you read that in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14 when he says that, that we are the light of the world. And you read that at your own time. It talks about the nations shall walk by its light. Hallelujah. In other words, the earthly nations will be guided and influenced by the light of the church on earth. Now, it might not be where it should be right now because the church needs to gird up the walls of their mind and get all about biblical context of livelihood and how to uh, walk according to the path that God directionally given us to walk. Now, to this idea, when we look at Revelations 22, verse 1 and 2, it adds that the tree of life has leaves for the healing of the nation indicating that the nations have not yet been healed. All right, Revelation 22, 1 and 2 says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, understand that. When we think about that, second, these chapters describe a temporal work of an ongoing evangelism. I know people talk about, will we be here in the tribulation? Will we not be here in the tribulation? But let's say focus on what we're learning here in this reference of the new heaven and the new earth on that era and that time, you know, we talked about the last days and we talked about the end of time and all that in the last teaching. The gates of New Jerusalem never closed. You see that in Revelations 21 and 25. It says, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Hallelujah. Now, outside them live those who were unclean and those are practice that practice abomination and lying. And the scripture says that in Revelation 21 and 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So this tells you that there was those that was outside of that kingdom, of that new heaven and new earth, that practiced abomination and lying. We just see it in the scripture. Now similarly, in Revelations 22 and 15, we read it earlier, it includes an existence of dogs and sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practice lying. Now, because of this of this description of heaven would not include people of the sort, we can see that this must describe a pre-final judgment setting. Stay, stay with me now. Now, because of this, it is reasonable to believe that Revelations 21 and 22 is not a picture of heaven, but of a new covenant Christianity. 
When we read these two chapters with this lens, we begin to see many pointers to our current reality in Christ. As God's missionaries on earth, one of our primary jobs is to be a light to the world and to bring people into God's new covenant kingdom. Now, most people don't preach or teach a kingdom, but this is a kingdom of God, and it's kingdom of God, according to Scripture in Romans, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. So, when we look at this right here, uh, as we have been given an assignment to bring people into the new covenant of God's kingdom, we look at Revelation chapter 22 and first verse, we read that earlier, we are invited to come to Christ. We all are. And that's what your job is. That's what my assignment is, to go out and bring people that are invited to the wedding or invited to the, the last supper, if you would. It's those scriptures that we read in the Bible. But we are invited to come to Christ, nevertheless, and drink of his water. And this is right in the scripture over in John chapter 4, 10 through 14. And it says this. Jesus answered and said unto her, he's talking about the woman that came to the well, and he was describing to her about she was waiting on the Messiah to come, and he was right there before her. It says in the scripture, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Glory to God. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou had living water? And verse 12 said, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, she asked him, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? And verse 13 and 14 said, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drink, <coughs> excuse me, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him, <coughs> shall never thirst, but in the water that I should give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Let me take you a drink. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So when we see that, Jesus was sharing to her about his water and the water that he gave that she could drink and never thirst anymore. And when we also look at scripture in, in John chapter 7 and 37, it says, in the last day, there's that phrase again, last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And then he shared his water with the world. Hallelujah. Well, if you take the drink of the water that he's giving you, you go out and give to someone else. Your cup may run it over, but that's the whole purpose of you drinking of that water, that your cup be full and run it over to others in the world. The people say that you can't lose your salvation. One say, they always say, well, listen, if you drink of that water, you are definitely saved. And one once you're saved, you've been set apart, and then you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's a whole new other teaching and understanding. But when we look at this, the city of God, the New Jerusalem, is also described in terms that symbolically picture the new covenant body of believers. First, we look at Revelation 21 and 14. It tells us that, that the 12 foundations of the city have the apostles' names upon them. These is an anchor to what Paul writes of the church being built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets. First, if we look at the scripture in Revelation 21 and verse 14 where he talks about these 12 foundations. He said, And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. You know why it was speaking of the number 12? The number 12 in biblical numerical meaning means perfect government, the number of government, 
number 12. So when we talk about that in reference to the number. But when we look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul even speaks of the church being built up on the foundation of apostles and prophets. Paul said this to the church at Ephesus. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So if a person is saved, they built upon that foundation of what's been prophetically and the apostles taught, and Jesus Christ is that cornerstone. So there's no other foundation whereby man can be saved other than Jesus Christ, the righteous. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Second, in Revelation 21 and 16, the city is described as a cube with each side measuring 12,000 stadia and approximately 14,000, excuse me, 1,400 miles. Now, according to the gentry, the scholar I was speaking about earlier, he said if one were to measure from Rome to Jerusalem, I haven't done the research on this, but he said the history of this, if you measure from Rome to Jerusalem, east to west, and from the northern edge of the southern edge to the southern edge of the Roman Empire, it would add up to 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles with the Isle of Patmos being exactly at the center. In other words, this is a picture of the presence of the church on earth during the first century when the New Jerusalem was established and God had came down to live with humanity. Now, let's look at that scripture in Revelation 21 and 16. It says, And the city lies full square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length of and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Now, I just gave you a scenario of what Gentry said about 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles from Rome to Jerusalem, east to west, and from the northern edge to the southern edge of the Roman Empire, it added up to about 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles. That is not a coincidence. That is biblically sound doctrine teaching about the era and the time of what this first century was looking at related to what we just read. Now when we look at this, thirdly, no temple exists in New Jerusalem. No temple exists in New Jerusalem. Revelation 21 and 22 said, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Now, in the New Covenant, we do not need an outward place for worship like an Old Covenant temple. Instead, each person, you and I, all of them name the name of the Lord, all that's been bought by the blood of Christ, all that's been born again is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and they worship God from the heart. It's an inside job, because once he indwells us, it's an inside job. This is our new covenant reality. He's working from the inside out, changing you, for you can bring change to people by bringing the conviction of the word of the Spirit of God, by you giving the truth of the gospel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In other words, on, on, on this side of AD 70, as we've been talking about, we are now living in a new heaven and a new earth. The old outward heaven and earth of the Mosaic law and the temple were forever destroyed. And the new heaven and earth of the new covenant relationship with God replaced it. The new heaven and earth and the new Jerusalem are spiritual realities of a new covenant, just like the new creation. 
And when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. He was speaking of a relevancy of the old, um, old uh, heaven and earth being destroyed in 70 AD and the new heaven and earth being established in you and I to bring forth the mandation, mandate of what God's purpose is. Hallelujah. That's good stuff. Now these terms here that have stemmed to prophecy far off into the future are the fact that simply speaking of a covenant transition and a new, our new creation reality. I hope you're walking in that new creation reality. If you're not, just stay tuned. I want to pray with you at the end of this. And if you haven't, you can receive what God is doing in the midst of who you are, drawing you out of here. You know the scripture says in John 6, and back forth, verse 44, except a man be drawn, he can't even come. God is drawing you, I pray, as you listen to this teaching, as you've been studying, as you've been seeking, as you've been asking, as you've been knocking, as you've been constantly drawing yourself to a place that can be pliable, that God can fashion you and form you by a creation of indwelling in your heart. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit that will seal you. Praise God. Now, to fully make sense of this, we must realize that the new creation grows gradually. Some Christians like look at the current state of the world and they say, because sin and evil still exist, that we cannot possibly be living in a new heaven and earth right now. What they miss is the fact that the Bible describes the expansion of God's will on earth and the new covenant kingdom in gradual terms. Gentry, that author I was speaking of earlier, he explains it like this. He said God generally works his will incrementally over time rather than catastrophically out at once. God works it out in you. That's where in the scripture of Romans 8 and 28 we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. See, if you call according to his purpose, that is working out for him expansion of his new covenant to be gradually changing and developing because of who you are, because of who we are as Christians, developing God's will in the earth. If you go all the way back to uh, the method uh, in the progress of redemption in time to Genesis chapter 3 and 15, it says this, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And even in Galatians chapter 4 and 4, it says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Hallelujah. In Israel's gradual conquest of the promised land, you look back in uh, for the second time, Exodus 23, 29, and 30, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 22, is God's unfolding of his revelation in history. And we can go to the prophetic word of Isaiah and see it in scripture when Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 28 and verse 10. Uh, I, I, I had those scriptures there. I'm sorry. I didn't think I had them. I didn't have it in my notes that I had it. But in Exodus 23, 29 through 30, it says this. This is the conquest of the promised land of Israel's gradual conquest. It says, And I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate, and the beast of the field multiply against it. But little by little I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. You see what he said there? That's a symbolism of God's ongoing process of him bringing the expansion of his will to the earth and his new creation kingdom gradually coming to play. And I 
understood that through Exodus 23, 29, and 30. And then also, I guess I did have uh, Deuteronomy 7 and 22. I didn't know I had those scriptures, but yeah, you don't have to go read them. Here they are. Deuteronomy 7 and 22 says, And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beast of the field increase upon thee. Now this is two scriptures there that speaks of God's covenant gradually being manifested in that particular time. Bring it into unfolding of his revelation into the history of where we are today. Isaiah prophesied it like this. He said in Isaiah 28 and 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Hallelujah. You probably heard that scripture before. And also in Hebrews 11, or 1 and 2, it said, God, who at sundry times in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us how by his son whom he had appointed as the heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. Glory to God. And this is an expansion of Christ's kingdom until the end. Glory to God. Now, Mark chapter 4, 26 through 32 says this. It's some more uh, scripture that references that. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Glory to God. Now this is an expansion of God's kingdom from the time of, as a, as a parable here, as he casts a seed into the ground, and it comes up, and it don't come up and grow all along all of a sudden, but yet you said, First the blade, then the ear, and then after that the full corn in the ear. And here's another scripture. Uh, uh, Mark chapter 4, and 26 to 32. Let me finish reading that. I'm sorry. Verse 230 says, And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? Now, this is scripture in terms of scripture. It is like a grain of mustard seed which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becomes greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. Hallelujah. Now listen to that. He's talking about the expansion of God's kingdom to the end. Now, again, the Isaiah scripture that speaks of in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 and 7. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from his forth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God, this is awesome stuff. I thank the Lord for the word of God that reiterates his purpose for our, for mankind, especially those that are born again. Thus, God declares, again, we go back to Revelation 21 and verse 5, where he said, I'm making everything new. 
21 and 5 said, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. While the spiritual work of salvation and the rebirth happened at the cross, the outworking of that event in our lives and in the world as the world has stretched across the years of history, since 1830, God is in the process of making all things new. Revelation 21 and 22 is not a description of a perfected heaven, but of a beginning of a new process, a making new process that God said he was doing. He was making everything new. Hallelujah. The New Jerusalem in Revelation 21 and 22 is not a description of heaven. It is a description of the new covenant, heaven and earth, that replaced the old covenant, heaven and earth. We know that the new Jerusalem is not a description of heaven because the new Jerusalem actually comes out of heaven itself. We looked at that in Revelation 21 and verse 2. It says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, preparing as a bride adorned for her husband. Yeah, we can eternalize that to a futuristic event. But when we look at this, also the New Jerusalem does not have a temple because the New Jerusalem people are God's temple in the earth. Yet the actual heaven does have a temple. We see this in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19. It says this, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightning and voices and thunder and an earthquake and great hail. Now, this establishment of the new covenant began with the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the new covenant age continues on as we co-labor with Christ to make all things new. That's why it's so important that you and I know the word. You and I stand firm in the truth. You and I be sanctified and set apart as Jesus prayed the high priestly prayer in John 17 and verse 17. He said, Lord, sanctify them with the truth. Thy word is true. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the kingdom now as we begin to close this thing out. The revelation, uh, this revelation here that we've been getting, it should bring us to a very important conclusion that we already live in an eternal new covenant. If you agree with that, shout amen or put amen in the comment section, if you would. We look at this in Hebrews 13 and 20. It says this, Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now, we are not waiting for it to appear in the future. We are not waiting for anything. We are not waiting on God because we already have him. We do not need to feel disconnected because his spirit lives within us. And we have an eternal covenant with him. In other words, we have a kingdom now. Jesus, the king, brought the kingdom. And it has been growing ever since he left us as his ambassadors. Now, it's our job, yours and mine, to do work toward expanding the kingdom of God. Not to sit around and wait for him to someday bring the kingdom. You know, people talk more about the rapture. I'll be glad when we get raptured out, raptured out, raptured out. But yet, the kingdom is in effect to be advanced right now. In the now. To be an ambassador of the kingdom that he made us and to effectively bring heaven to earth in the now. We need to recognize that the kingdom is here and is ever expanding for you and I. Many people think the world is getting worse, but the Bible tells us the opposite. 
that the kingdom of God is always growing in size and in influence. And it's Isaiah's prophecy of the birth of Christ. Even so, he said in verse 7, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace. There's no, no, no ending to the increase of God's government. You just need to be doing what you need to be doing. I just need to be doing what I need to be doing. We, as the body of Christ, need to stand firm. Hey, bring it to prayer out of churches, right? I mean, excuse me, out of schools right now because you didn't stand up, because I didn't stand up, because they at that time didn't stand up and profess that his kingdom is in a set in a circular process right now to surround us and advance us. Let's keep praying in the schools because it was important. That was just something I gave you for free. That's not even in my notes. His kingdom and its good fruit are ever increasing. But we've got to stand firm and do what we call to do. We see the same principle in Daniel chapter 2 where Daniel interprets the King Nebuchadnezzar's dream about a large and dazzling statue. In that dream, the head of the statue is made of gold and his chest and his arms of silver and his belly was and thighs was bronze and his legs was iron and his feet was partly of iron and partly of baked clay. And, and as the king looks at the statue, that large rock, not cut out by human hand, rolls into a uh, it, it rose into it, a smashing it, feet, and his iron, and his clay, and he successfully, the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, all broke into pieces, and they blown away, leaving no trace. However, the rock grows into an enormous mountain that fills the entire earth. And when we look at that scripture, Daniel exclaims, this statue as a prophecy of the five kingdoms leading up to the establishment of God's unending kingdom on earth. And during the fifth kingdom, Jesus came to earth, died on the cross, established God's new covenant kingdom, symbolized by rock not cut by human hands, and that would never be destroyed or left to another people. According to Daniel, this kingdom would crush all the previous kingdoms, but it would endure forever, and it would expand until it filled the whole earth. And you can read that from Daniel chapter 2, 31 through 45. This is the new covenant kingdom. Let's read that scripture right here. I just explained it to you, but let's read it. Daniel chapter 2, 31 through 35, right quickly says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and, from, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and a part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out with hand, without hands which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and of clay, and it broke them into pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken into pieces together and became like the chaff of the sorrow threshing floor. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. And, we'll, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. In verse 37 to 39 said, Thou, O king, art a king of kings for them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, another kingdom, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over the earth. Now watch this. And fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, 
For as much as iron breaketh into pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all things shall it break in pieces and bruise. 41 says, And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with my clay, watch this, as, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so kingdom, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with my clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, hallelujah, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall be shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. What are those kingdoms he talking about? Verse 45. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. And the great God had made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Hallelujah. The interpretation thereof is sure. This is the new covenant kingdom. Hallelujah. In Matthew chapter 13, uh, 31 to 33, as we close this thing out, Jesus gives two similar pictures to describe the ever-expanding nature of the kingdom. He compares it to yeast in dough and how it works its way through the whole loaf. He also compares it to a small mustard seed which grows into a bush and turns into a tree. And then it becomes the largest tree in the garden. In this, this way, the kingdom ever expands. Even just to, statistically, we see proof of this in history. When we look at the scripture, and we look back at AD 100, one out of every 360 people was a Christian. Now, when we look at back in 2010, it was approximately one out of every three people. The kingdom is expanding, not just in numbers, but in influence as well. I don't know what the statistics is in 2023 as we speak this now, but this is the glory of God's kingdom. This is our mission and our destiny as a church. Paul makes it clear to us in the letters. Uh, let's look at Matthew 13, 31, 33. Then we're going to look at the letter that Paul wrote to Ephesians in chapter 1 and verse 9 and 10. In Matthew 13, 13, 31 through 33, he told that parable I just explained. It's give you the scripture now. It says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Hallelujah. Then he gave also the one about the uh, kingdom of heaven in reference to uh, the, the yeast in the dough. We're not going to go to that one. Uh, it did say it right here. I'm sorry. It said, Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of a meal till the whole was left. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. But now let's look at what Paul was speaking of when he made it clear in this letter that he wrote to Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. It says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had, Purpose in himself. Hath passed him. Purpose in himself. 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Hallelujah. Even in him, our future holds the unification of everything in heaven and on earth. Right now, heaven and earth are not in unity, but we are moving toward unity. How beautiful it is that brethren dwell together in unity, as the scripture says. But wherever famine, war, political corruption, adultery, abuses, lies, sickness, disease, death, and any other evils exist, they create a disunity between heaven and earth. We are here, you and I, are here as Christ's ambassadors to call out those lies, lay hands on the sick, to, to, to bring about the, the, the end to wars and different things, to, to bring about the kingdom of God. We're here as the ambassadors of Christ to establish this unity, you and I and the body of Christ, the church of the living God. That's what we get to work towards. Every day, as a new covenant believers, we live in a spiritual reality of a new heaven and a new earth, here and now. The old covenant heaven and earth are gone forever, and only a better covenant remains. Now, as Christ's ambassadors here on earth, we get to co-labor with him by the function of the function of the Holy Ghost Biding in us and us laboring with him to making all things new. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you for watching again. This is the Bible Old and New Testament Covenants, the New Heaven and the New Air, Part 2, the 16th the message, excuse me. We talked about the kingdom now, ending this subject on tonight's teaching. And next week, I think I've got one more teaching unless the Lord prevents me to go on, is talking about the one law. You and I are the one law. One law now. Not all the laws of the Old Covenant, Ten Commandments, and all the 460-something or 620-something, I can't remember the exact number, but the law of Christ and the loving like he loved. The law of the Spirit of life of Christ, Jesus dwelling in us. So next week we're going to talk about that, the one law, and we'll continue to get this message out. And hopefully you'll get something out of it. You'll grow and learn, develop, and get busy about advancing the new kingdom of heaven and earth in the now. Hallelujah. This is James Buckley. Thank you again. As always, Lord, I pray that everyone that's watching, everyone that will watch, everyone that do hear this message, Lord, will be pricked in their heart with desire to walk after you and to look to you where all they have come from. And Lord, you give them an opportunity to be filled with your spirit and give them the opportunity to go forward and advance the kingdom of God, that your name will be made honorable and that glory and honor will come to the advancement of the kingdom. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we all say, Amen.